In my last video, I recreated the entire overworld from the original Legend of Zelda in a new 3D style, and I also said that I would do the rest of the game in another video. So this time around, I'm going to be doing all the dungeons and the boss fights that I didn't get to last time. Also, I'm going to structure this video so you don't have to watch the other one first, but if you enjoy this one, make sure to watch that one as well. Picking up from last time, we finished working on Link and most of the items that he'll use in the game. So the first thing I wanted to do this time was create all of the different levels. Each level reuses the same room, but with different colors for the walls and the floors. So I started off by making a cube, spreading it out, and adding walls and a ceiling to it to make a basic room. The inside of the room was very dark, and the object had a lot of unnecessary faces on it, so I removed the faces on the outside of the object, and only left the faces on the inside. Doing this lets light shine into the room, even though from the inside it looks like it shouldn't. Then I noticed that each room can have up to four doors, one on each of the four walls. So I made another shape to roughly estimate the size of the doors, and then overlapped it with one of the walls. I found out from last time that using the experimental feature to cut holes in objects crashes Unity, which is probably why it's an experimental feature in the first place, so I had to do something else to cut a hole for the doorway. I selected the face of one of the walls and created a new face inside of it. Then I scaled that down to match the dimensions of the doorway, and now I can delete that face for a door. I can repeat that for all four walls, then I can add and remove doors easily. The last thing to do is create some new materials for the walls and the floor so we don't have to look at the default material Unity applies for you. Even though there are 9 dungeons in the game, there are only 7 different color schemes since levels 5 and 7 share the same color, and levels 8 and 9 share the same color. So I made 7 textures for the floors and made materials out of them. But for the walls it gets more tricky. I can't just replicate the texture the game used because the walls are shown at a distorted angle. So what I had to do was count how many sections you can see on the wall and match that up with how many pixels wide the wall should be. Then I kinda just winged it from there and it turned out pretty well. The last thing to do was apply all these materials to the rooms, and then we would have all the rooms finished. But there was one problem. When I applied the materials to the walls, the textures didn't line up properly. The way I fixed this was creating new materials for each wall and changing the texture offset to line it up. But don't do this when making games, I'm just an idiot. I realized afterwards that the right way to do it would have just been to select the walls and fix the UVs. Sometimes I hate when there's more than one way to solve a problem because I usually pick the dumbest way possible. Anyways, now that the rooms are finished I can start laying them out in the shape of the different levels. Each level has a unique shape described by the name of the level. For example, level 1 is called the eagle, so it's shaped like an eagle. Level 2 is called the moon, so it's shaped like the moon, and level 9 is Death Mountain, so it has a fitting image of a skull. While I was duplicating the rooms and making the shape of the levels, I came across a reddit post that showed that all of the levels actually fit together like puzzle pieces, so I decided to fit them together the same way. But at that point GitHub started yelling at me because the file size got too large to fit everything into one scene, so I had to split it up into two scenes, one for the first six levels and one for the last three levels. With the layouts of the levels finished, I decided to start adding in the rest of the details. I cut out a hole for every doorway, but that left me with an empty space that would cause Link to fall into a bottomless pit of nothingness. So instead I had to go and create a model for the doorframe, then I could slide that in between the gap for every doorway. Then there were also two types of doors, one that needed certain conditions to be met before opening, and one that needed a key to be opened. I spent some time placing all the doors in the right spots, but for now it's just for aesthetics. I'll be working on the programming part of it in a bit. Above the doorways are two things that hang on the wall, which to me look like light fixtures. So after adding those in, I tried adding a little light source to them, but it looked strange so I got rid of the light sources. After finishing all the details of the walls, it was time to start adding the extra details for the floors. Some rooms have different floors other than the default tiled floor. Some of these rooms have spotted patterns that look like sand. Some have sections of water or lava that require Link to have the ladder to get past it, and some just have a blank black texture. There are also dotted patterns at the entrance to every dungeon, each with their own color palette. It became very tedious making new materials for each type of texture and each color for the different dungeons, which was why the level building took the longest out of anything for this video. After creating the different floor patterns, there were two more props to fill in the levels with, the blocks and the staircases. I noticed that the blocks actually share the same design as the blocks from the original Super Mario Bros, so I basically already had that done from when I remade that game a while back. From there, I just placed around the blocks and staircases until everything was finished. The only thing I had to be careful of was making sure that some of the blocks had physics enabled, because some of the blocks can actually be pushed around. And with that, there's only two more things that I need to make before moving on to the enemies. If Link takes one of the staircases, he'll be brought to another underground room. Some of these rooms are passageways that lead to a staircase in another room of the dungeon, and some are just rooms that hold important key items, like the bow in level 1. But these rooms were kinda hard to visualize since they were so narrow. And now the last thing I needed to add was the old man rooms. Each dungeon has at least one room where there's an old man standing between some fire, ready to depart some wisdom upon you. The things he says are supposed to help you in your journey, but I don't know how I feel about some random old man telling me that the 10th enemy has the bomb. At this point, I thought it was about time to start adding in the enemies. When I made my last video, I was intimidated by how many enemies there were in the overworld, but part of the reason I held off on doing the dungeons last time was because of how many more enemies were actually in these dungeons. There were so many enemies that I didn't really know where to start, but I decided on starting with the bat enemies called Keese, since they are in nearly every level. 
I made two animation frames to make it look like it was flapping its wings, and then used one of the artificial unintelligent scripts that I made from last time. These keys aren't very interesting since they don't drop items, and they can be defeated with only one attack. Moving on from the keys, I decided to do some of the other enemies with similar movement patterns so I can keep copying and pasting the same scripts to make my life easier. The style foes just flip back and forth and move around like the keys do. In the original game, there was something called the second quest, which is like modern day new game pluses in games. In the second quest, the style foes could also shoot swords, but we're not going to worry about that for now. The next enemy was the gel, which are identical to the keys in every way except for their model. The only thing worth noting is that their colors reflect which dungeon you find them in, so they might be green in level 5, but they'll be blue in level 2. The Zol are basically just giant gels. If you don't deal enough damage, they will actually split into two gels. And I'm feeling this enemy was probably the inspiration for another enemy from the Ratchet & Clank series. The Bubble is a flying skull inside of, well, a bubble. This enemy is invincible, and touching it will prevent you from using your sword for a short period of time. For the Dark Nut, I just modified the model for Link by adding a new head and adding a cape, so it's easy enough to model, but fighting them is actually the opposite of easy. These guys can't take direct hits from the front, and can only be attacked from the side or the back. To program this, I basically just had to compare the forward angle of Link and the forward angle of the Dark Nut. The like like are enemies with a lot of health, and are annoying to deal with because if they grab hold of you, they can destroy the magical shield if you have it, leaving you with just a regular shield. The Gibdo looks like a genie with an extra leg, but doesn't pose much of a threat other than their high HP count. The Gorias function just like the Moblins, except that instead of shooting arrows, they throw boomerangs. And the last simple enemy to add was the Wizrobe. These guys are wizards who wear a robe. Clever name there, Nintendo. They move around and shoot magical beams at Link. These are the same magical beams that we made last time that Link can shoot using the magical rod. After speedrunning my way through all the simple enemies, at this point I was still only halfway done with all of the enemies in the dungeons, not including bosses. So let's continue on. The traps are a unique enemy since they don't actually have any health and can't be defeated. If you walk within range, the trap will activate and send a spiky block hurling towards you. To avoid getting hit, you have to move out of the way fast enough. Sometimes the traps will block doorways that you need to go through, so you'll have to debate them and then walk by while they slowly reset. The next enemy was the Wallmaster. This enemy is a giant hand that will grab Link and take him back to the start of the dungeon. Like its name implies, it's a master of the wall because they can move in and out of it. The next enemy is the Rope, but it's not actually a rope because it's a snake. These guys use a familiar movement pattern, but if they see Link in their line of sight, they'll actually start charging at him. They can detect if Link is in front of him by using raid casting, and it's been such a long time since I've used raid casting, which is weird because I used to use it in pretty much every video that I made. The Vire is a four-eyed demon beast with wings. They move around like normal enemies, except for the fact that they bounce up and down while doing so. They also have a similar mechanic as the Zol, because unless you deal enough damage, they will split into two red keys. The red keys are exactly the same as the normal blue keys, so I'm not really sure why it doesn't spawn blue keys. You know, considering that it has the same blue wings. But anyways, the next enemy is the Pole's Voice. Like the Vire, these enemies will hop around while they move. However, these guys have a lot of health. You can defeat them by lowering their large HP pool, or by firing a single arrow at it. Or, you could just shout at them with your microphone if your console has that. Gone. And now the last three enemies were the most difficult to make, and were almost as challenging to recreate as the bosses. The Moldorm and the Len Mola were very similar, so I'll start with those. These enemies can be damaged by attacking their different parts, and will get shorter as they lose health. They also move around in a way very similar to the old game of Snake. Now, I have no idea how to make Snake, so luckily I found a tutorial that teaches you exactly how to do that. And I definitely made sure to follow along this 20 minute tutorial, and didn't even think for a second to scroll down and copy and paste the code from the top comment. Thank you, random stranger on the internet. But with the game of Snake, you only ever add parts to the snake body. You never remove them. So I had to write my own way to remove the parts of the Moldorm and Land Mola, and also make them take damage. And finally, the last enemy was the Patra. This one is almost like a mini boss, as it only appears in level 9, which is the last level in the game. There's one big blue Patra in the middle that moves around slowly and acts as the main target. Then there's eight smaller orange Patras that patrol around it in a circle. So far, there's nothing crazy here, but it quickly started turning into a nightmare when I realized that I had to keep the orange patches in the same spot while the blue patcher moves around in turns, while also making them expand and contract at random times. This enemy took a lot of work to get done correctly, and it feels like it's probably one of the most impressive things I've done so far in this channel, even if it seems really basic. Now, even though I said the patcher was the last enemy, there's technically still one more enemy, which is the stone statues. There are actually two different models for the stone statues, one for the statues on the left, and one for the statues on the right. In continuing my tradition, I always make at least one model that looks great from every angle, except for the front, which is, well, interesting. These statues also have different color schemes for each level, so I had to change the colors around to make new materials for them. And then after doing all of this work, I realized that most of these statues don't actually do anything at all. Most of them just sit there and do absolutely nothing. There are only a few rooms in all the levels where these guys will shoot projectiles out at length. 
These statues can't be damaged, and the only way to get them to stop firing is to defeat all of the enemies in the room. And then I realized at this point that there were actually a few more things I needed to do before finishing up the video with the boss fights. Defeating all of the enemies in a room can also do a few other things other than making the statue stop firing. Doing so can also open up certain doors, and then some rooms may even cause an item to drop. Some of these drops include basic stuff like rupees, but other rooms drop more important stuff like the map, the compass, or a key. These last few items required me to update the UI that I made in my last video. Without the map, you shouldn't be able to see anything other than Link's current position. Although once you get the map, you can see a layout of the entire level. The only thing not shown on this map are the hidden rooms. Some rooms are hidden completely behind walls that can only be accessed by using a bomb to open it up. So I made it so that using the bomb on certain walls will open up a new doorway. The compass will highlight an area on the map where the Triforce is located in the dungeon, and the keys will allow you to open up the doors with a keyhole on them. The number of keys will be shown on the UI bar. It's also worth mentioning that you can find a magical key in level 8 which will give you an infinite number of uses. The key counter is instead replaced with an A, which means almighty. And with all of that out of the way, it's finally time to start with the bosses, and I'm going to save the best for last. First up is Aquamentus, the boss of the first level. It can shoot out three fireballs at once, but can be blocked with a magical shield. The fight itself isn't that difficult, as it doesn't have that much health. Dodongo is the boss of the second level. You can't directly attack this boss, and the only way to defeat it is by placing a bomb in its mouth while it's open. The only way to know this is to receive some wise words from the old man in the dungeon that says, Dodongo dislikes smoke, which is supposed to mean the smoke from the bomb, I guess. The boss of level 3 is the Manhandler, a plant boss. This boss kind of functions like the Moldorm and Len Mola, since you have to defeat the parts of it before it goes down. Although it can also be defeated in one shot with a well-placed bomb that can hit all of the heads at once. Gliok was an interesting boss to make, and it was also the boss of the fourth level. I made the head, the neck, and the body separately, although I'm not really happy with the way the body turned out, but it looks fine when it's actually in the game. To defeat Gliok, you have to attack the heads, and once one of the heads is defeated, it disconnects from the main body and starts flying around until all of the heads are defeated. Boss number 5 is Dig Dogger. If you can understand what the crazy old man in the dungeon is saying, you'll understand that a certain kind of sound that Dig Dogger hates is the whistle. Using the whistle in this fight will shrink it down and make it easier to defeat. The next boss is Goma, the boss of the 6th level. Goma has one weakness, an arrow to the eye. Knowing its own weakness, Goma will open and close its eye, and you can only damage it while its eye is open. And then levels 7 and 8 don't feature any new bosses, they just reuse bosses from the previous dungeons. Although level 7 does have a hungry Goria that blocks your path, and the only way to get by it is by giving it food. And now for the finale of the game, the final boss Ganon. Ganon is able to disappear and turn invisible. Link must wander around aimlessly and try to attack him, while also dodging projectiles that materialize out of thin air. Whenever Link hits Ganon, he'll reappear, sometimes in a new pose, letting you know that he's been hit. Link must then repeat this a few more times until Ganon is done and changes color. At this point, the only thing that will stop Ganon is firing a silver arrow to stop Ganon once and for all. If Link didn't find the silver arrows hidden away in level 9, then the fight will start over. After defeating Ganon with a silver arrow, Ganon will be reduced to ashes along with his Triforce of Power. The doors to the next room open up, and after clearing out the flames, Link can finally save Princess Zelda and end his journey. And if you are still confused, yes, this is not Zelda. This is Link. This is Zelda. Alright, see ya.